On this edition of Native Report, we meet artist Francis Yellow. We learn about the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act of 1971. And we visit the northernmost city of the United States, Barrow, Alaska. We also learn something new about Indian Country and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community, the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandin Foundation. Welcome to Native Report, I'm Stacy Thunder. The life experiences of Francis Yellow are evident in his paintings and drawings that are filled with colorful, expressive figures and cultural motifs. He is where he is today because of his ancestors, his elders, and the life of the people. On this cool fall day, Francis Yellow is outside the All My Relations Gallery in Minneapolis, Minnesota, describing the teepee he painted for an exhibit. What I wanted to show here was uh, the power of our life life. Here it is in a single uh, structure, that concept of power, like waka, wakanki, good and bad together, positive and negative light and dark, male, female. As he talks, he uses terms such as wasichu, a Lakota word meaning greedy person, and lifeway, a holistic system of knowledge based on the law of relatedness. Here, you know, this exhibit, this is about, I suppose, tradition as a uh, living thing. And we say that about our lifeway, it's a living thing. Our language is a living thing. Because in life, anything that exists in life is powerful. Power means good and bad together. I'm of my people, you know, the Lakota people, the friendly people. I'm of my people. One of our names for ourselves is Ikchewichasha, I mean common red man. It's an expression of uh, relatedness. So what that means as a common red man, no matter what I do in life, I'm a family man, I'm a relative. Whatever they experience, that's what I experience. So, you know, I, I appreciate it that way. I'm of my people. So what I make as an artist reflects that. You know. It doesn't reflect the church, it doesn't reflect the state, it doesn't reflect Washichu society. It doesn't reflect the tastes of collectors. His life experiences are reflected through his art. The most affecting are the years at boarding school. In doing these works here, you know, I, I had to re dredge up those memories. It's a fresh wound, yeah. The first boarding school I went to was a BIA boarding school, a pure Indian boarding school. My elder brother, he was seven years older than me. He started running away. What they used to do is shave uh, runaways, shave their heads bald. And at that school, they had what they called the gauntlet. The older boys would uh, line up on two sides, and you had to run between them. They'd kick you or punch you. I had a really good. Uh, art teacher in uh, Boys Town. He's an African-American guy. Really strict, but he, he, really, he really taught me some things about drawing. So I could draw realistically to the extent that uh, at one point I was a courtroom sketch artist for a TV station in Rapid City, South Dakota. 
But having mastered that, and I could do it uh, in sculpture as well, three-dimensional, as well as two-dimensionally. But I found myself thinking, uh, what do I do with this? The things we used to draw, you know, we draw on any kind of paper, notebook paper. So there's ledger art. My ancestors were doing that. Here, we're, here I was in boarding school doing the same thing. They looked at any books that were about ledger art that had anything to do with that. And of course, in my practice of a life way, the direct practice, experience of it, helped me to see what my ancestors were doing. I'm not an Indian artist, I'm an artist who happens to be Indian. You know, it sounds profound, I guess, but like of everything of modern day culture, society, it's just on the surface and doesn't mean anything. How do you happen to be Indian? Just happen to be. You know? And why is it so important to make you know, such a distinction. Again, you know, art, that's not our word, that's not our concept, it's not from our life way. Indian isn't from that. American Indian, those are all uh, epithets, if anything. Why would we want to call ourselves American Indian when we have our own age-old name? Maybe it's convenient, just like the word art is convenient. I'm not in this to make a name for myself, and even though I need to eat like, just like everybody else, that's not it either. I'm interested in the life of the people, so that the people will live. I do this so that the people will live. That's an old saying. Did you know the 1971 Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act was the largest land claim settlement in United States history? The settlement extinguished Alaska Native claims to the land by transferring titles to 12 Alaska Native regional corporations and over 200 local village corporations. A 13th regional corporation was later created for Alaska Natives who no longer resided in Alaska. The act came about because in 1968, oil was discovered at Prudhoe Bay on the Arctic coast. Because of the difficulty of drilling at such a remote location, the best solution seemed to be building a pipeline to carry the oil across Alaska to the port of Valdez. From there, the oil would be loaded onto tanker ships. The plan was approved, but could not be started until the native claims had been settled. With major petroleum dollars on the line, there was a new urgency for an agreement. And in 1971, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act was signed into law, which abrogated native claims to aboriginal lands. In return, they received up to 44 million acres of land and were paid $963 million. The Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act of 1971 is the largest land settlement in United States history. Intended to resolve the long-standing issues surrounding Aboriginal land claims, it raised several issues of concern that have yet to be resolved. On this morning at the annual convention of the National Congress of American Indians, one topic of discussion is the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. I think uh, the land claims uh, uh, bill um, came about uh, because uh, there was um, a lot of oil in um, the North Slope and uh, the need for uh, the pipeline to be built uh, from Peru Bay to um, uh, Valdez and uh, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act was uh, uh, signed into law uh, by President Nixon in, on December 18, 1971. 
and they were uh, three areas of concern that we have had um, with the uh, land claims uh, settlement. And uh, they were um, those children uh, uh, that were cut off uh, because they were born after December 18, 1971, and uh, the issue of uh, extinguishment of our Aboriginal title to the land, and uh, and our and the extinguishment of our hunting and fishing rights uh, on uh, on that uh, on that bill. Basically, it created kind of two classes within our society. And it also uh, limited our land base from the millions of acres that we had claimed to, and we still have claimed to, to now only uh, a couple hundred thousand acres in the vicinity of our village. Well, the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act was the last termination act. It was the last termination act. Uh, immediately afterwards, they uh, adopted the Indian Self-Determination Act, but it was the last termination act, and it affected uh, a huge area, a huge area. Yeah, and, uh, and many different nations of people. It was with one, uh, with one signature by Nixon, one broad stroke, it, uh, it devastated our relationship with the, with the United States government. This act also established 13 regional corporations of the 229 federally recognized native communities and villages in Alaska. Corporations, as you know, are, are state chartered uh, organizations, and with that comes a lot of um, power and uh, recognition. So at, we are at a point right now where we're um, we're sort of competing with corporations for um, for tribal recognition. We don't want that to happen. We want tribes to maintain their status as sovereign nations and continue our. Um, relationship with the federal government and, and be recognized as a tribal nation. For us, we have uh, 1,488 tribal members. Now, out of those tribal members, maybe about 300 of them are shareholders in the corporation. So most of the people uh, are tribal members, but they're not shareholders. So you, know, you have these, this uh, discrepancy and the who can uh, participate um, with the corporation, you know, and it's also, there's also this notion that corporations um, have a limited lifespan, okay? So reconciliation with the corporation isn't necessarily our interest here. It's reconciliation with the United States government is our, our issue. Consulting with Alaskan tribal leaders is Ada Deer, who was instrumental in helping solidify federal recognition of Alaska's tribes, but who also knows firsthand the effects of termination. The Menominee Indian Tribe of Wisconsin was the first tribe terminated in June of 1954. We were the first tribe restored in December of 1973. And actually there are 12 corporations under ANSCA and then there's 13, the 13th one is inclusive of people outside of Alaska. And the point really needs to be stressed that the land is uh, held by the corporations and the land is held as an asset to be utilized to make a profit and as traditional people say would you sell your mother being mother earth and this is so diametrically opposed um, to the traditional way of life of Native people that any reasonable person would understand their suffering um, and the severe damage that the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act has resulted in to the Native people in the villages. I was born in 1945, August 17, a free indigenous man. I heard the birds calling those were our food. When the salmon ends toward May, we look to them for food in spring camps. I was born to hunt freely in any direction that I wanted to hunt those blackfish pike that fed our family. 
and my parents tell me God gave us that resource to survive as an indigenous person. And my children, my grandchildren, and my grandchildren are the victims of this so-called federal law and stuff. This is whom I'm talking for their future. My life here is near end. I'm 66 plus years old, but I'm speaking for their future. 40 years of denying uh, my existence is too much. You know, uh, in my entire generation, well, we're still here, you know, and we're not going anywhere. And, uh, you know, we're gonna be here. And the idea that um, we shouldn't be recognized or that we shouldn't um, have uh, the right to do what our, our forefathers uh, before us have done is, uh, is a genocidal practice. My dad led by example. He was a very good man. And uh, he taught me just about everything I know, encouraged me, and, um, and my mom was the same way. So, you know, they always encouraged me to reach for more and do better. I was always involved in um, all through school in organizations and Future Homemakers of America and uh, baton twirling and the band and, you know, so I would just basketball, I loved basketball, softball, all sports, and I excelled in those. And so, you know, it's just something that happens in your life and your parents have a certain expectation of you and they have a certain expectation of all the siblings in the family. You know, we were all expected to go to school, to get good grades, to work hard, and that's what my parents instilled in me. For the next six episodes of Native Report, we are pleased to air Barrel Whalers of the North, produced by Jeannie Green of Alaska. In part one, we watched the community help with the harvest of a bowhead whale, an event of great cultural importance to the Inupiat. It's Sunday morning, June 1st at 11 a.m. in Barrow, Alaska. VHF signals carry the urgent message from a whaling crew out on the ice. Straight down from UIC parent office? Okay, we got two guys heading down there. And also like cell phones in a city, residents here in Barrow rely upon the VHF as a source of communication. By now, half the town knows that one of the whaling captains has caught a whale and needs as many hands as possible to help pull it up on the ice. The whaling crew's flag has been perched on the tallest piece of ice, signifying a successful hunt and marking the location of the harvest site. As soon as news hits town, a smaller flag is put on the rooftop of the captain's house, letting all those in town know that a whale has been caught and whose crew caught it. One by one, people show up at the side on snow machines and by whatever means necessary, ready to work and work hard. Go! The whale, 
a 56-foot female bowhead whale, will take a while to get up on the ice and even longer to butcher. Captain of the crew, Henry Kignick, has his work cut out for him. Henry will have to determine how this whale will be brought up on the ice, especially with as few people as there are present. Another block and tackle is hooked up. This should make pulling the whale up on the ice a little easier. The bowhead whale can often weigh in excess of 60 tons, and that requires a sturdy piece of ice that will support that much weight. Fortunately, the captain has chosen a sturdy piece of ice. It's now just a battle of physically getting the whale up on the ice. Snow machines are added to the mix, along with a few new recruits. Inch by inch, the whale slowly comes out of the icy waters. Keep in mind that what's showing at the present is only about a quarter of the whale. They keep us busy all night. You've seen it out there. It was. They never stop. Sometimes they get tired, you know. it. It's a lot of work. Sometimes they take a nap out there when they get a little too tired, you know. It's, it's get to you, but you know, you gotta be strong to, to do the job. You gotta finish the job. And no matter what we do, I have to thank the Lord for giving us strength. I will provide, I will provide what we need the most. And we share with the people. The decision has been made to start cutting up the beach part of the bowhead, harvesting what's available, and lightening their load for their next attempt at pulling the whale up on the ice. The whale skin and blubber, or muktuk, as it's known in the Inupiaq language, are cut into long, strip-like portions that are easy to carry, or should I say drag. Long hooks are inserted into the muktuk, allowing the hookers to pull on the muktuk so that cutting the blubber away from the body of the whale can be done much easier. In this case, there is only enough room on the ice for a couple of cutters. The whale will need to be pulled up further on the ice before several cutters can participate. That way.
When the muktuk is cut away from the whale, it is dragged to a different part of the ice where others load it into sleds to be hauled to the shore. As you can see, it takes the cooperation of many to make such a feat possible. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, you can find us at nativereport.org and on Facebook. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors here on Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. Hope to see you next time. Stacy Thunder is a member of and legal counsel for the Red Lake Nation. And Tad Johnson is a member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa and is chair for the American Indian Studies Department on the campus of the University of Minnesota Duluth. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community, the Malax Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandon Foundation.